Welcome everybody, this is Computer Vision. I am Tim, uh, I'm your professor uh, this semester, and today I'm gonna introduce you to our Computer Vision course. I'm gonna do this with uh, two PhD students, Manuel and Doana. Manuel will uh, primarily focus on um, the assignments, on all things practical. Doana will help me uh, create the slides. Now for the assignments, um, we will have Jupyter Notebooks that you will pull from a repository that we'll share with you uh, on Thursday. Um, and those assignments contain um, exercises for you that focus on key concepts of a lecture. Uh, these will give you a hint about what we think is re really important. Um, you can also uh, decide to go on like a sidetrack uh, for the assignments. If you are proficient in C++, you can go ahead and um, here click on this link um, to visit our bio tracker, which is a computer vision framework written in C++ and we need help uh, developing it further. So if you think you're a pro in C++, let me know. Um, the submission will be done in groups of, let's say, two people. I think this is still unclear because uh, I think the number of, um, of enrolled students in the course might, might uh, grow, but so far I think we have 65 and uh, two students per group is enough. Uh, you will upload your solutions as a PDF file to the whiteboard and um, you'll be graded, um, I hope, as soon as we can. The details about grading, about how to submit, will be shared by Manuel um, on Thursday. You can collect bonus points on um, um, those assignments that will be added uh, to your points uh, for the quizzes. The quizzes are um, like semi-finals, let's say, uh, two quizzes make up uh, the, you know, common um, final. They will uh, be announced in the whiteboard. Please don't forget to register. Um, each quiz is 45 minutes in duration. Uh, so the quizzes are basically, basically uh, our exams. We'll have two half exams. Um, those dates will be shown in the whiteboard. Please don't forget to register. Um, each of uh, these quizzes will be 45 minutes in duration um, and will um, add up um, the points that you earn in both quizzes and then grade the sum. The lecture uh, it will be divided into a couple of blocks. Um, the first three lectures will cover uh, computer vision and image processing fundamentals. So we'll look at color spaces, uh, convolution, um, edge detection, um, histograms, and so on. We'll then move towards a short um, you know, phase in which we look at conventional, um, let's say non-neural um, computer vision algorithms, uh, optical flow, uh, uh, half transform, um, feature detectors like SIFT or SURF, and then we will we'll move into um, deep learning because computer vision nowadays is basically only that. Uh, we'll have to introduce you to uh, neural networks, how to train neural networks that will take up two or three lectures and then we'll go to all, all different applications um, with um, example algorithms or architectures and we'll discuss these um, in the main body of the lecture. And then in the end, we'll look at a couple of new um, algorithms, a couple of cool things as like an outlook for you to um, maybe invest more time in, in other lectures. So let's start by asking, okay, what is computer vision? Um, the way I and the way we will define that in the course is um, that this process is basically reducing the, the dimensionality of our input data, which will be an image or a sequence of images, 
Um, so high dimensional means we have a lot of um, numbers that describe whatever is on the image. And uh, we'll reduce this to a low dimensional description of what is on the image. Um, and this abstract information, you know, could be just one number, or could, could be a handful of numbers, and uh, the number of pixels could be easily many millions, right? So this process here will be based on uh, the detection or the extraction of relevant features, and then whatever the task then is, maybe a classification, maybe a regression. But what these terms uh, mean will be covered in the couple of following slides and lectures. So let's have a look at an example. Um, let's think of what goes into a computer vision system as an image or a sequence of images. And the different questions that the system should be answering um, could be, for example, whether there is a dog or there's no dog in an image. So that is a binary classification or multi-class classification. So if you know, one or um, more multiple of these output classes uh, are detectable in an image. So if there, for example, is a dog or if the scene um, is outside, uh, if there's something or someone smiling in an image or if there's snow. Right? So in contrast to these you know, categorical outputs, we could have like a space of continuous outputs, which, for example, could be when we ask for bounding boxes. So an object could be defined on an image, at least, you know, in this rectangular kind of uh, boundary. And uh, we use four numbers, you know, usually the top left corner and the width and the height to define where that box is. Yeah. Could be multiple boxes even. Um, we could also use just the center um, position in the image um, of that object to be uh, found. Um, and that could uh, even be uh, going through time, right? We could also use uh, or ask for a caption, an image caption, right? Uh, that describes what we see on an image. And um, you'll find these um, terms in the, the literature and the papers that we'll share with you and also in the books that you will find on the website, on the, on the whiteboard side. Um, image uh, or object detection, image classification, image localization, tracking, usually means tracking an object's location through time, uh, image captioning or image segmentation. And in the course of the lecture, you will uh, learn sample algorithms that um, you know, fall into each of these categories. Now, to understand what the pro or the challenges in computer vision are, we have to first understand what are images. So if we zoom in on one of those examples here, uh, you'll, you'll see that um, an image is basically composed of these blocks that we call pixels. And these pixels, um, you know, obviously have a location and a color or a brightness. So um, the brightness of a pixel um, is basically the result of a sampling process in the camera hardware. Um, so this is a CMOS sensor, um, you know, standard piece of hardware in every smartphone or webcam, for example. And this area here, um, that's where uh, light um, is collected, right? So there's um, a lens uh, that, that focuses the, the image on that area here which could be as small as like a centimeter, for example, uh, in squared. Um, and those pixels here, um, you know, that could be, let's say, 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. Each of these image locations now um, collect light, so photons. They produce a charge that is converted to a voltage, then, you know, might get amplified and then digitized. And then each of these pixels 
uh, provides a number that corresponds to how much light uh, could be registered at that image location. Now, while the sensor has the resolution in space, uh, each pixel also has a so-called depth um, that tells you how many different gray values or how many different brightness values we can record uh, per pixel. Yeah, so typically, uh, or the standard setting is 8-bit. Uh, it really depends on the sensor and on the configuration of the sensor. Um, an 8-bit means um, how many different values of brightness correct to 56. Um, so think of grayscale images or gray value images. Um, you know, as uh, like a, a matrix of numbers. Um, and each of these numbers is basically a point on that brightness dimension, right? And by convention, we say, okay, the minimal value, zero, corresponds to the black as black, and the maximum value, so 8-bit uh, images have a maximum of 255, um, that means white, okay? And so um, it usually makes sense to think of an image as a matrix of numbers, but it sometimes also makes sense to think of an image as a landscape of, of brightness values, right? So you could think of um, bright um, areas as like mountains and dark areas as like valleys, okay? And that visual representation um, often helps in those future algorithms that we're gonna talk about. Now, in color images or with color pixels, um, this you know image location property color is you know usually not represented in a single number. We use um, something that's called color space, and intuitively, what we do here is we use two or more different basis functions, let's say, or basis properties. So for example, red and yellow are mixed um, to an orange, right? So and then we count maybe 100 red units and 30 yellow units, and then everything is uh, you know, smooshed together. So that is that specific, or that results in that specific orange. And so mathematically, what we do here is uh, you know, simply use two, um, orthogonal properties, so red um, and yellow, um, and we define this orange pixel as a vector in that space. Now, red and yellow are uh, pretty uncommon as a color space. We usually use RGB for red, green, and blue. So an image now is um, not a matrix anymore. It is um, three matrices, basically. Uh, one matrix, um, you know, holding the brightness values for the red channel, another matrix, uh, the brightness values for the green channel, and uh, another, a third image that holds the brightness value uh, values for the blue channel. So a pixel at the location x, y now comes as a triplet of well, those three numbers, and the choice of those numbers uh, directly defines um, the color of that pixel. And again, here we can think of the uh, RGB uh, color space as a space in which a you know, arbitrary um, color now is a point or a vector uh, in that three dimensions. So images are basically a ton of numbers. You know, it could be a million, three million, or even more numbers. And um, our tasks that we discussed before, so detecting objects or tracking objects or you know, segmenting the image into different, uh, different areas is really hard. Think of an object detection task or a classification task where we want to detect dogs. There's a lot of variability going on that 
makes it really hard. We can't just, you know, have a prototypical dog, you know, have an image of a dog and then match a new image, uh, you know, or the you know, match those pixel values against that image. And then, you know, if the distance between those two is smaller than a, than a, than a, than a threshold, then, you know, the new image is a dog, that won't work. I've collected a couple of examples that like should visualize, uh, that should demonstrate why that, that is so challenging. So, um, so look at this um, image here to the top left. Um, one of those things that make uh, vision really hard is because the, that the same object, so here in this example, the dog, may look, you know, very differently. And even, you know, as seen from the same uh, position of the camera, maybe even using the same lighting conditions, um, you know, the, the object um, of question may move, may turn, may, you know, even deform itself in the image. So this pile of numbers uh, may look, you know, very differently from, uh, from one second to the, to the other. Um, there another, uh, there's, there's another um, set of examples that I'm going to run you through. So obviously we have um, variability within a class, so all dogs may look quite differently because of different, I don't know, features like fur color or fur or texture or, or size. Uh, we also have the problem that, um, you know, some of those classes um, may look very similar and we have the problem of discriminating between those different classes and also variability comes in because the environment um, you know may bring occlusion like here and we still I mean as humans understand that that is a bear because of the you know still very telling uh, features that remain like like those claws here and lighting uh, brings in a lot of structure, like in, you know, think of this um, hill and valley visualization of an image. There's a lot of structure going on in some of those images, and still uh, we as humans are able to tell that that is a face, uh, but our algorithms should also be able to. Okay, more example, uh, examples of the cases that I described to you on the previous slide. This is... Uh, the problem of discriminating between um, images that look very similar but you know correspond to different classes um, especially here in humans where we have different um, you know clothing um, you will see a lot of intra-class variability detecting humans then means to kind of uh, implicitly know or you know, allow for, you know, those samples to look differently, to still be detected as humans. And scale variability, um, you know, often corresponds to uh, scenes being three-dimensional. So objects could be far away or very uh, close to the camera. And that typically defines their, their projection size uh, on the sensor. So we want our algorithms to be um, invariant uh, against these changes. Okay, now, so we know that on the pixel brightness or the color value level, objects may vary drastically. So comparing images based on you know, information on that level won't work. I promise, don't try that. So, but what does? And um, we will learn in that course uh, a couple of low-level image uh, features. For example, we already talked about the property of a pixel. So one image location mm, may come with color information, um, but if we use spatial information or temporal uh, information, so we, you know, looking at how the brightness of a pixel changes over um, the image space or through time, we can extract um, features like edges or um, motion and that may give us more information than the simple 
raw uh, pixel values. And <clears throat> so a huge part of what conventional classical computer vision was about was manually defining those target features. Yeah, so let me switch to my pointer. Um, so look at this space. I haven't like, you know, named those axes because they, they can be arbitrary, but the, the task um, you know, for decades was, given my problem, let's say we want to detect dogs, what kind of uh, image structures uh, do we as computer vision engineers have to extract um, to like get an edge um, to to dis to be able to discriminate between dogs and non dogs, um, um, and um, right. So basically, what we want is we want those axes, um, those features to be defined such that our samples, so all our dogs, those red circles, and all non dogs, those uh, blue stars are you know maximally apart so we can easily say okay all those are dogs and all those are non-dogs and um, since the dawn of um, um, you know deep uh, learning and deep computer vision models those features are now learned so they're basically you know um, automatically extracted from the data set um, and we will, in this lecture, touch some of the classical algorithms to give you a notion, okay, what was that like? But also um, to touch um, the basic, you know, concepts and architectures of deep vision. So, you know, after this uh, lecture, you know how to do vision properly and, you know, uh, in, a, in a modern way. But also in some of those cases where you don't have enough data, for example, um, you know, knowing about those, um, let's say, classical algorithms may come in handy. Okay, let's now move into an actual tracking or detection algorithm, um, which is based purely on color. Um, so we've cleared up the question, uh, what is color? But now how can we use this property to identify objects and how can we represent um, so-called foreground objects um, in the color space by defining a subspace, yeah? a positive subspace? Um, and you know, what are the limitations and what are the problems with using uh, color alone? The first algorithm that we want to implement with you is an algorithm that I call detection via binarization. Um, so we will have an input image with colored objects. And uh, for a certain definition of color uh, or the target color, um, let's say we look for blue objects, the immediate result will be an image of the same size, but now with the pixels being either black or white. So it's a binarization um, of each pixel's um, color. Um, we basically want to use now a definition of a positive subspace in color space. So for example, um, here we have a cube uh, within uh, the RGB color space and it defines a certain interval for each of the axes. So, uh, you know, for the, for the red value, for the blue and for the green value, we have like a certain interval that needs to, that needs to match. And if it does, then that pixel is within the positive subspace and then it will be um, evaluated as one. So we basically run through the image uh, pixel by pixel and for every pixel that we take, we uh, take the color of that pixel, look into the color space uh, and see if the definition uh, is a match or not. 
and if not we put in a zero and if it is a match so if that pixel uh, color triplet um, is within the defined bounds then uh, we put a one in there uh, resulting in this uh, black or white image and that simple algorithm works even uh, for some examples in the real world so take for example this image of the three bottles uh, they are um, discriminable by color you know pretty easily for the human eye and let's have a look in the color space here we see uh, those distributions of uh, yellow and pink and blue pixels but um, one of those things that we used in the previous slide the definition of the positive color space um, wouldn't work well here you know why well because these distributions here are not cubic so it will be really hard to um, define a cube that is big enough that all the blue pixels fit in there but is small enough that um, you know the other colors aren't in the positive subspace yeah in much more natural uh, photographs like this one here um, it may get even messier because uh, yes there may be objects like this pair of pens in green here that uh, is well discriminable um, and may even work with a cubic subspace but uh, more you know challenging objects uh, appear like this this blouse here which is uh, this kind of uh, rosé or whatever color that is um, you see this this uh, this sweatshirt here or the the rooftop here or in, in the back pixels that um, will be in that point cloud so even if you had a tighter definition um, that adapts to this distribution of, of pixels of color um, um, you will have some false positives so pixels that will be binarized as one um, even if they're not belonging to the target object. And of course, sometimes your scene just won't work with color. So for example, um, you know, when object colors like the, the sweatshirt here of that woman uh, blend in with the background, or if you wanna track a face, uh, and the hair color is pretty similar to the face color, that won't work. Okay, so your first exercise for um, this lecture is implement the idea of having a uh, cube subspace P in the RGB cube, then iterate over all pixels in the image and check if the color that you find in each of these pixels belongs to P or no P uh, or non-P. Yeah. Um, then write the result to a new image uh, and then play around with the size and the shape of that positive subspace and look at how this affects the uh, binarized output. Okay, so from that pre-processing step, we will get a binary image, which you know is still pretty unhandy. We don't know uh, where the object is. We, I mean, see it as humans, but uh, we need to extract some properties of this binary blob there that tells us where um, is the object, right? And that, that question, so how do we represent the object, you know, clearly goes back to your task. So if, for example, you're only interested in the position, well, then that's it. You just extract the, the center position, for example. But if uh, the orientation of the object is relevant for you know, your downstream tasks, well, then you obviously also have to extract the scale. And you know, some common um, um, features that we then would try to now extract from this binary blob are position, the orientation, as I said, but also like the scale, right? Could be far away, could be close uh, to the camera. We could extract that kind of scale parameter 
And um, one common uh, way is also to extract a bounding box, like we said, like uh, that's depicted here. Um, that kind of tells you um, how much uh, in width and height the object takes from the from the image. Yeah. Now, a common uh, recipe for uh, processing binary images is first applying so-called morphological operators. Um, they have two kind, kind of tasks. One is to remove noise, and the second is to close possible gaps that um, you know, are due to the definition of the positive subspace. Um, so noise um, you know, are false positives, so um, ones in your binary image that shouldn't be ones, and uh, gaps are zeros, so false negatives that shouldn't be zeros. Yeah? Um, and morphological operators will be covered in the next slides. After we've uh, processed this binary image, we will then find the so-called connected components. So here uh, within the bounding box, we'll see two connected components, right? Um, the name tells you what exactly they are. So we will have a look at how that um, can, or how these can be found programmatically. Um, so let's start with morphological operators. Uh, they're based on a so-called structuring element or Strukturelement in German. And you, so, mm -hmm, you can basically uh, set up um, any, you know, structure, but let's for now uh, think of this structuring element as this uh, five pixel definition. And we'll use this to move over the input image, over the binary image, and set an output pixel at the same location where the structuring element is centered to one if either all neighboring pixels, so and the neighborhood is defined by the structuring element, are one, and we call that erosion, or um, we set uh, this output pixel to one uh, if at least one of those neighboring pixels uh, is one, and then, then we call this dilation. So let's have a look at an example. Um, so here in the background, you have the binary image with, you know, those one, two, three, four, five, six pixels um, set to one, and the rest is zero. And our structuring element is centered on this pixel here. We could also start uh, with the very first pixel and, uh, you know, the, this, with, um, you know, the, the topmost and the leftmost um, neighbor, uh, neighborhood pixel being outside the image borders. And, uh, but this is a, like, a, like a boundary condition. We can talk about this later. And uh, let's, let's uh, now think of the structuring element be, uh, to be centered here uh, on top of this first um, white pixel. And now we'll um, create an output image, which we start off as uh, blank, as, as fully zero. And we set this uh, corresponding position in the output image to one if all neighborhoods uh, or all pixels in the neighborhood are one, which is not the case here because uh, only two of the, um, uh, of the five pixels are one. Yeah? So, uh, so if we run an erosion operation, um, this output pixel would be zero. But for dilation, um, at least one of those neighbor, uh, neighborhood pixels is one. So the output pixel um, would be one as well. Yeah? So we move the structuring element uh, pixel by pixel over the input image. We compute the output of this simple um, if statement. Yeah. So here, the this position is the only position that would result in a one for for an erosion operation. And um, this is what uh, my brain computed. I hope that's correct. Yeah. So you can 
uh, run you know, that for yourself and see if you come up with the same result. So you see that um, dilation does what the name says, uh, it like dilates, it makes bigger this object and uh, erosion kind of removes um, border pixels, right? So pixels at the boundary of this object. And um, so you can also imagine that if this was just a small noise element, uh, it would be gone after an erosion operation. And also um, if there would be a gap um, between two parts of the same object, the gap could be closed by running a dilation operation, or by, by using the di dilation operator. I have, um, you know, uh, marked those last three uh, letters here uh, in bold because we differentiate, uh, differentiate between morphological operators, which is dilation and erosion, and morphological operations. Um, we define two operations, uh, opening and closing of an image as um, successive um, calls to um, either erosion and then dilation or first dilation and then erosion. And um, so what we, what we see here is that, for example, we have uh, in this example, uh, two objects that kind of connect they shouldn't connect because they're two distinct objects. So what we want is to open this gap, right? So we don't want them to, to touch. We want to have, to like, we want to detect two separate instances of this object. And so what we do is we first call erode, which would, uh, you know, shrink the object blobs in size, but also open the gap. And since then the objects are too small, we would like to uh, re, you know, recover their original uh, size and then uh, by calling dilate on the result of erode um, would, uh, would accomplish exactly that. And now here, because of um, maybe a too tight color definition, uh, we get a, a binary image result um, from, from the color um, uh, look up and we would like to close those gaps because those gaps are really you know within the boundaries of the object and so what we do is we first dilate so we we make the object bigger but also inside its boundaries bigger so we close the gaps and then since the the object uh, grew in size we kind of recover the original size by calling a road again yeah so now that we have like removed noise, closed gaps, or even opened um, gaps between uh, the, you know separate objects, we have to now find um, which blob uh, or which pixels belong to the same object, and that operation is called connected component analysis. And what we basically do is we have an input image like here, the one on the left. Uh, with binary objects, and we would like to then know, okay, this, uh, this object here uh, is composed of pixels belonging to the same class. So it's basically like this coloring problem. Um, every color now represents uh, an ID or a class. Um, and uh, so all the connecting pixels that uh, belong to one object should now be labeled as such. And uh, that's the remaining task for today. So how do we do that? So let's start with uh, this input image here. We only have one object. And now our task is to run the connected component analysis to um, you know, label each of these pixels to belong to the same object class or to the same um, label, let's say. We first need to define a so-called neighborhood, and there, there are many ways of defining that. Again, uh, we will use this, uh, you know, plus or cross-like uh, structure. So this is called the four neighborhood. So because the center pixel has four neighbors, 
and uh, obviously uh, you know adding those diagonal uh, neighbors to the neighborhood uh, results in a so-called eight neighborhood you can define your neighborhood pretty much arbitrarily uh, but these two variants are the most common now to run the algorithm we move the neighborhood um, pixel by pixel um, row by row um, through the input image and once we hit um, the center pixel um, that has that is um, that is a one right so that that belongs to a blob to, to a binary blob we then evaluate um, in our output uh, label map whether the neighboring pixels have already uh, been labeled and since this is the, the first run here um, they have not and so we assign the center pixel a um, uh, the label one we continue that in the next pixel um, the, the next one that we hit in the input um, is then again evaluated whether um, you know it, it has neighbors that have already labels again in this case they have not and so we increment the previous ID that we have and assign then the two to this pixel we uh, run it run this neighboring element uh, again through the next row of pixels hit another pixel which has not um, um, yet any neighbors that have been labeled so we assign it the next id in line so that is the three and now we hit a pixel that does have two neighbors that have already labels and uh, since these do not have the same id we take the minimum okay so this is the one here and now we continue running this algorithm like i showed you before uh, through the entire remaining image and this is what our results will look like now you notice that uh, the object uh, that is you know composed of connected pixels uh, now appears to have three different ids ones and twos and threes and that's why we run a second pass using the same neighborhood and then consolidate um, the ids of the pixels by uh, looking at you know always the neighborhood and then taking the minimum ids that um, those pixels have so that brings us to your second assignment um, you should be starting from the binary image that uh, you know is the result of the color detection or the, the binarization uh, that we just discussed before uh, erase noise with erosion dilate and recover the original size of the object then implement the two pass algorithm um, and for those who like a challenge can you do it with only one pass um, and another challenge is can you extract the bounding box on the fly maybe even in that one pass okay looking forward to seeing your results okay so let's conclude this lecture with another pretty simple feature which is the brightness difference to a background image so um, especially in lab settings when you have a static scene so nothing's really moving in there you have you know a static like a, a homogeneous background either all white or all black and your objects um, are well discriminable from that background well then you should use background subtraction and this is what um, we are doing with biologists uh, here in berlin these uh, animals are guppies, so small fish like uh, this big. And the background is fairly static. There is some jitter because of, you know, the waves and stuff. But still, um, you know, the, uh, the signal is strong and we can um, detect this. And now I'm going to show you how that works because it's pretty similar to what we have uh, seen for, for color.
So um, we do background sub uh, subtraction, um, but first we need to form a background hypothesis or a background model. So we do that by taking um, the like the previous background uh, hypothesis, and let's now assume we already have converged to something, um, and we add it uh, with the current image at time point t, right? Now, we do give both a weighting uh, with um, this parameter alpha, and alpha is between uh, 0 and 1, and your choice of alpha defines uh, what kind of uh, results you get, and you should be playing with that in the assignments. But let's uh, for now just digest what, what I, uh, I wrote here. So the last um, background is updated uh, with uh, the current image, and that is what we call background model. And this is also uh, called an exponential average. And um, you should also be seeing an assignment on why that is an exponential average. Look at this video here. Um, this uh, is from frame number one, and you should be seeing it popping up uh, in a second, um, this one. Um, so you see, like, building up the background hypothesis uh, is fading out the structures that move the, the objects, and it will keep, you know, all the information like the tank here, this edge of the tank, and um, you know, they're like, they're, there's a plastic uh, sheet which has a little ripple, and you know, these things uh, are clearly visible. And then you can also see now these these darker gray uh, like lines, and these are uh, the fish that swim through the tank. And by adding this onto the background hypothesis of the of the previous step, uh, you still see you know evidence that there was fish. But um, this is what a background image looks looks like with a given um, choice of alpha. And then you use this background model, this background hypothesis, to then subtract um, the current image from. Right? So, um, you know, in the general case, when you don't know whether your object is brighter or darker than the background, you use uh, the absolute differences. You could also use, uh, you know, you could also um, remove these uh, bars to then have either uh, positive differences or, or negative differences, you know, whatever your, your um, tank or your scene then provides. And then you ask, okay, is the difference larger than a certain threshold? This parameter needs to be obtained, you know, by manually um, inspecting the results. Uh, but basically, what you then end up with is a binary image again, and you could uh, then post-process this as we seen with erosion and dilation uh, in connected component analysis. Okay, so that was our first lecture. We have seen what an image is, how do we represent images, grayscale, and color. Uh, we've seen what the challenges are in computer vision and um, have learned about a simple way to binarize an image based on color and uh, just here at the end based on the pixels brightness differences to a background hypothesis. We have also seen how we can use erosion and dilation to remove noise, to close or open gaps, and uh, find um, you know, which pixels belong to each other. Uh, from these components, we can then easily obtain uh, bounding boxes or positions, and uh, we'll learn much more in the next lecture. See you soon. Bye.